have a uh, the most interesting luncheon speaker today. Some of you are in his workshop. This is Marco Sagoni, who's the director of evaluation uh, at UN Women. And Linda gave a, a, a nice and full sort of description of Marco's marvelous and wonderful career that's very much span various parts of the UN system. He's vice chair of the United Nations Evaluation Group, UNEG. He's co-chair of Eval Partners. And so he's had positions in UNICEF in the uh, regional office for the Central and Eastern European and Commonwealth states and the like. He's an author of many publications. I think one of them's right there on the table with you that you're welcome. All of those uh, publications are complimentary for you, so take as you wish uh, what's there. So it's very nice of Marco to bring this material and, and share it with us here. Anyway, his, his title of his conversation with us today is Looking to the Future, Partnerships for Equity-Focused and Gender-Responsive Evaluation. Uh, he is, he's a very important uh, force in evaluation, and he is, he's always cutting at the edge. This man is really good about identifying emerging issues in evaluation and bringing them to the fore, both in the UN and in the larger evaluation community. So I would ask you, please, give a warm IPDET welcome to Marco Sagoni. I get to meet visiting government officials. I can read newspapers in a regular manner. I have access to credit or microcredit. I can speak in community meetings. I won't face discrimination or stigma when using public services. I will be consulted on issues affecting health services in our community. I can pay, I can pay for treatment at a private hospital if necessary. I eat at least two full meals a day. <laughs> yeah. I'm not in danger of being sexually harassed or abused. I have my own income. I can question expenditure of community funds. I have access to the legal counsel of a lawyer. Thanks a lot. Who are you? I'm the Ministry of Health, Minister of Health. Okay, how do you feel? I feel good, great. Okay. So I see that you are here first online. Do you, did you know that there were other people that started together with you? Uh, not really, yeah, sort of, yes. <laughs> because it looks like they, they are lagging a little bit behind. Did you ever turn around to look at what was happening to, to the other people? No, I didn't. <coughs> Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. Who are you? I'm one of the top five richest business women in the country. <laughs> and did you realize that in the beginning you were together with other people? Kind of. <laughs> and that now you are here alone yeah. together with a minister. Yes. And what do you think that happened to the others? They dropped along the way. I don't know what happened to them. Probably they were not as focused as I am. <laughs> did it happen to you to, to look back what's, what's going on with the others? Honestly, I didn't. Okay, thanks. Hello, who are you? Hello, Hello. I'm a village chairperson. Ah, okay, so did you realize that you were together with others when you started? Uh, yes, I did. Yes, we were very much together in the first step, probably. <laughs> but then somebody else went, well... What do you want? Those are big people coming from city. Oh, no, I'm not even looking in that direction, so it's not my, my world. Uh, okay. So were you looking 
on your back? I was, I was, because, well, they are, they are my people. They elected me. It's our village. It's our life. This is, this is our life here. No, the, not there, no. Not there. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Hello. Who are you? I'm a rural, uh, a woman from a rural village, and I suffer from domestic violence. And what were you feeling when you, you were seeing that the others were just going uh, so far away from you? I was feeling that uh, we are not equal, and um, that it's a pity that the society is divided in that way. And do you think they were caring about you, that they were thinking what was happening to you or not? Nobody cares about me, not even my husband. That's why I suffer violence. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello, who are you? I am a 13-year-old orphaned girl. And from where did you start? Well, I basically started where I stand. And what were you feeling when you were seeing the others going, going along? I don't even know who they are. And do you think they were caring about you? Were, were, were they looking back to what was going on with you? No, nobody looks back at me. Okay. Thanks a lot to our volunteers. <laughs> As you will have realized, that was just, that's called the power walk. It's just a kind of role game just to try to reflect the reality. Because unfortunately, that's the reality. That's the reality in villages, that's the reality in several countries, and that's the reality even at global level. We, we, have a, we are living in a, sorry, so, what? I tried this one. We are living in a situation, in a world, that uh, I think is pretty different from what we would like. And in the next 20 minutes, I will try just to talk a little bit on, about the world that we are living in versus the world that we would like to live in. I will talk a little bit about equitable development, what it is, why it's important, how to, to achieve equitable development, and then at I will have also some good news to share with you. And then also, what's the challenge for the evolution community and how we can move forward? First of all, the world where we are, we are, where we are living. As I said, I mean, this uh, role game unfortunately reflects the reality in the world where we are living. It's a world of a massive concentration of wealth where 40% you know, of the world wealth is owned by the richest 1% of the population, while the poorest half own only 1%. It's a world where development is unfinished business. You know, out of 5 billion people in developing countries uh, live on a, I mean, out of the 5 billion developing countries, 2.5 billion people live on $2 per day or less and 1.3 billion on 1.25 cents a day or less, so below the poverty line. Almost 1 billion people still malnourished. One in three women and girls will be beaten, raped, abused, or mutilated in their lifetime. I mean, one in three. I mean, it is something that, you know, if it was not from statistics from the UN Statistical Division, I would not trust that. that the statistics, but that's it. One in three. If we look at the MDGs, it's something pretty similar. You know, MDG one, but you can see employment. You see there is a big disparity gap between uh, men and women. When it comes to school also, there is a big disparities of, for female and male that are out of school or rich and poor. Also, when it comes to 
to powers, I mean, to representatives in the parliaments. Only 20% of parliamentarians are women. And also when it comes to maternal health, we have some regions like, for example, Southern Asia, where the, the average age for a marriage is 16 years old. So whatever MDGs we are looking at, we see that there has been a, a lot of progress done, but still a lot of challenges, especially when it comes to disparities and, and inequities. So the first question is, is that the world that we, we really le, would like? Or we would like a world where all rights for all human beings everywhere and at any, at any time are enjoyed. And I think that's really the, the, the objective and the goal of all, of all of us as development community. That we are all working for a, a world where equity is a reality, a world where everybody regardless of gender, you know, income, ethnicity, disabilities, race, religion, where everybody can, can really enjoy all human rights. But the issue is, do we want to be like this guy? For a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree, regardless if you are a, a fish, an elephant, a monkey. And the idea is, is the, the idea of equity is exactly this, that equity is a strategy to achieve equality. We are the, during the work cap. So if we want everybody to be able to watch the match, we have to be aware of the different realities. Because if we, if we give the, distribute the same resources, regardless of the situation where different population groups are, that will be the result. Where you will have a, the poor child who will not see the, the match, while the tall guy who will see the match. But if we want to achieve a situation where everybody can, can see the match, then we have to prioritize the most disadvantage. So if we have limited resources, if we have only three boxes, with an equity approach, it means that the tall guy, in this case, doesn't need a box, but uh, the short child will need not only one, but he will need two boxes. So equity is really a strategy to achieve equality for everybody. Equity means that we as development community, we need to be aware of the unfair disparities that are existing in society, and we should prioritize the most disadvantage so that everybody can enjoy his or her human rights. Now, why does equitable development matter? I mean, why, why care about that? Well, first of all, inequity constitutes a violation of human rights and hampers the equitable achievements of human development and even the MDGs. Equity has also a positive impact in the construction of socially fair and democratic societies. We are seeing also what's, what's happening in several parts of the world. And the last example is the Arab Spring, where this disparity, social economical disparity, grows to uh, to, the, to political unrest. But equity has also a significant, significant positive impact in reducing poverty and in, a economic, in, a, in facilitating and strengthening economic growth in a sustainable manner. So equity is important not only because it's right in theory, but also because it's right in practice, not only for ethical reasons, but also for practical reasons. The good news is that several countries are recognizing the importance of equitable development and the international development community too. As you may be aware of, 2015 is the last year of the Millennium Development Goals and as of now, 
the international community is already discussing what's going to happen after 2015. It's already discussing the, what will be very likely be called sustainable development goals. So that will be after 2015. And more and more states, they, they all agree that equity and gender equality should be key in the future generation of sustainable de development goals. For example, when it comes to gender equality, there is an initial agreement that gender equality should be both a standalone goal as well as mainstream along all the different uh, goals. So that's good, good news. And because the sustainable development goals will also influence the national development goals in the, in the different countries. So what are the implications to the evolution community? If more and more countries are moving towards equitable development, how we as evolution community will be able to evaluate equitable development intervention? What are the evolution questions to assess interventions that interventions are relevant and are having an impact in decreasing inequity, in achieving equitable results, and are efficient and sustainable? What are the methodological, political, social, and financial implications in designing, conducting, managing equity focus and gender responsive evaluations? And most importantly, how the capacity of government, civil society organization, and communities to evaluate the effect of intervention and equitable outcomes for marginalized population can be strengthened. And that's why there is more and more discussion about equity focus and gender responsive evaluations. You know, I mean, equity focus and gender responsive evaluation is an assessment made of the relevance, effectiveness, efficiency, impact, and sustainability of intervention on equitable development results with a specific focus on, on gender. And let me just show you this graph because I think it's pretty powerful and it communi communicates pretty well on, on the key, on what's the difference with an equity focus uh, evaluation. Imagine you are evaluating the national nutrition policy of one country. And this is the stunting that mainly is the malnutrition. So the malnutrition trend for children by wealth quintiles. So you know, you started your national policy in 96, and after 10 years, you are evaluating your national policy. The, the line here with a, in brown is the national average. So you can see that the percent of, of children malnourished went from 50% in 96 to down to about 35% in 2006. So if you are evaluating this national policy with a, let's say, traditional evolution approach, the key findings would be good. Malnutrition went down by 50% to 35%. So main findings, the national policy is effective, and therefore main recommendation, go on with this national policy for the next 10 years. However, if you are using an equity focus approach, the findings will be pretty different. Because with an equity focus approach, you look at the disparity gap between the worst off and the best off groups. In this case, it's about poor and, and rich children. You can see the poor are the blue one. So you can see that the poor, it went up, malnutrition went up. While in the case of the richest, that is the violet one, it went down in a significant manner. So if you are evaluating the exactly the same policy with an equity focus lens, the key findings would be very different from, the, from a traditional evaluation because you would say two things. The first one is that the disparity gap between the richest and the poorest, or the best off and the worst off, not only it did not decrease, but actually it gets wider. And the second key finding is that the situation of the poorest children 
it did not improve, while the situation of the richest ch children, it improved in a significant manner. So your key findings with an equity focus evaluation would be debt policy as a problem. So pretty different from a traditional evaluation. So with the traditional evaluation, the key finding, your national policy is very effective, recommendation gone. With an equity, equity focus evaluation, your key finding would be, well, while the national average is, is going down, the disparity between the worst off and the best worst and the best off is getting worse, and that policy is uh, uh, affecting in a negative manner the poorest. Therefore, the recommendation would be you have to adjust your national policy. So you can see that is really, is really a quite different approach is compared with the, with the traditional evaluations. Now, the issue is that when it comes to equity focus and gender responsive evaluations, there are several challenges. There are challenges in promoting the idea of the equity focus evaluations, and that co could be political and social resistance to addressing the causes of exclusion and vulnerability. Because very often, the worst of po populations, they are worst off for some specific reasons. They are worst off because of the power relationship in the country. They are worst off because of the social cultural norms in the country. So there may be resistance to have a, an equity focus approach. The, there may be resistance to empower the worst off groups. There could be lack of interest or incentive and even re reluctance to invest resources in the worst off groups. Or weak capacities to implement targeted approaches, for example. But there are also challenges in implementing equity focus evaluations. Can be methodological challenges because usually equity focus interventions are more complex because they, they, yes, they must take into consideration the power relationships, social and cultural norms in the country. So by definition, they are, they are more complex and therefore they, they need a, some methodologies that are a bit different from the ones that we are used to use. There is an issue of a, often lack of disaggregated data or weak data collection capacities for disaggregated data. As you know, disaggregated data comes with some additional cost. So th there are quite a number of challenges. So even if it's right in principle, it, it's, it's a bit more challenging in practice. So the way forward would be to have a systematic approach to strengthen national capacities for equity focus and gender responsive evaluations. A systemic approach where you should strengthen both the demand side as well as the supply side of evaluation, meaning both the capacity of policymakers to demand for evaluation and to use evaluation, as well as the capacity of evaluators to supply evaluation, good quality evaluation. But then you should look both at strengthening the individual capacities, the institutional capacities, as well as the enabled environment. So to do that, we think that the best way is, is to have a wider partnership. A partnership that brings together different stakeholders, that brings together national and regional professional evaluation associations, that brings together UN agencies, multilateral banks, donors, government from the north and government from the south, universities, and NGOs. And the good news is that this, this partnership is already existing, and it's called Eval Partners. And you have some leaflets about Eval Partners on, uh, on the table. So why Eval Partner was created? First of all, because for the first time there was a realization that there is a, a critical mass of expertise existing in the, in the global south. Till 15 years ago, national evaluation associations were mainly, were, there were about 15 national evaluation associations and mainly they were in the north. You know, the American Evaluation Association, the Canadian, the, Australi the Australian, 
the European, the UK, etc. But in the last 10 years, that number went up from 15 to almost 150 national and regional relations associations. And the big, big majorities are from, uh, are from uh, the global south. The second aspect is that there is a willingness of different stakeholders to collaborate together to strengthen, to strengthen nation capacity development. And just to give you a few ideas of the key achievements of, uh, of EVAL Partners, EVAL Partners is uh, adopting the systemic approach that I just described before. When it comes to individual capacities, there are about almost 20,000 registered participants from 178 countries at the e-learning that are offered by Eval Partner through the Miami uh, website. And once again, you have some uh, leaflets on your table if you want additional information. And the good news is this, this is e-learning. You have both the world-renowned speakers that goes you know, from the Michael Quinn Patton to the Michael Bamberger to many others. But more and more, you have also speakers from the regions. So for example, IPEN, that is the Regional Evolution Association for the countries from the former Soviet Union, they came up with an e-learning in Russian taught by, by local people uh, and relevant to the local context. The same RELAC, the Latin American Evolution Association, came up with a e-learning in Spanish. The same EVALNET, sorry, EVALMENA, with an e-learning in Arabic. So more and more space is being given to the leader of evaluation of the evolution community from the global south. When it comes to strengthening institutional capacities, Eval Partner as a, a series of peer-to-peer uh, -peer mutual support programs that mainly facilitate the collaboration between evolution associations from the south, from the south to the north, from the north to the south, from east to west, etc. And there have been already 31 national and six regional evolution associations that have been uh, engaged in this peer-to-peer -peer mutual support, support group. When it comes to the enabling environment, we, we got the involvement of parliamentarians. So in South Asia, there is already a, a South Asian Parliamentarian Forum for Development Evaluation. In Africa, there is already also an African Parliamentarian Forum. And uh, in the Arab states, also another one. So more and more parliamentarians are getting engaged to have national evaluation policies uh, adopted in, in their own countries to strengthen the national uh, environment for, for evaluation. But more importantly, our partner is achieving uh, the goal of uniting different people in, a, in, a, in, the, in the recognizing the diversity. So it's a growing and diverse global community working as a flexible network movement. Local meaning that is based at local level, but is reaching the glo global level. And it started from a small group of people from uh, IOC, that is the International Organization for Cooperation and Evaluation. It grew up, uh, for example, this is the first uh, global forum of Eval Partner in Chiang Mai, in Thailand, two years ago. And now it's really a global movement. And this global movement declared 2015 as the International Year of Evaluation. So the International Year of Evaluation is a, is a global initiative of coordinated local actions. The main uh, idea is really to advocate and promote the demand and use of evaluation in evidence-based policy making. And this, the main idea is really to try to reach out from the evaluation community. I think that we as evolution community, one of the failures that we have we, we had in the past is that we have always been talking among ourselves. If you go to conference meetings, etc., on evaluation, you find the evaluators. It's very seldom that you will find policymakers, decision makers, that are those who are supposed to use the evaluations, the findings, the recommendation of, of our evaluations. 
So we really want, through the International Year of Evaluation, we really want to reach out policymakers and decision makers so that they can, on the one side, understand why evaluation is relevant to their work. But on the other side, we want to bridge the gap, the bridge between the evaluation community and the policymaker community. And why 2015? Because, as I said, in 2015, the MDG uh, come to an end. And one of the weaknesses of the MDGs is that while monitoring was pretty strong in MDGs, as you probably know, the UN Secretary General every year is producing an annual report on the progress towards the MDGs. And that's possible because the MDGs has a tracking system in place. But that's not the case, in the, in the, that's not the case for evaluation. Evaluation is not mainstream in the MDGs. So we know if we are on track or not with MDGs, but we don't know why we are on track or why we are not on track. So the entire idea of having 2015 as the International Year of Evaluation is to try to influence the future sustainable development goals and have evaluation mainstream in the sustainable development goals. So when it comes to the International Year of Evaluation, what's happening right now? At global level, UNEC, that is the UN Evaluation Group, that is the network of the evaluation offices of 43 UN agencies, is trying to push forward a resolution, a UN resolution in the UN General Assembly on evaluation. And that would, uh, is also a way really to, to get ambassadors, to get policymakers aware of evaluation and active and, and engaged with, uh, with evaluation. We are also organizing high level events, both with the parliamentarians, with, uh, with ambassadors, et cetera, both in New York, but also uh, in the region. The last one was in Bangkok a few months ago. And also briefing with the member states, regional groups. At local level, we already have 15 countries that made the declaration of the International Year of Evaluation. Initially, it was declared by the 160 participants from 60 different countries, the Conference on National Evaluation Con national evaluation capacities in Brazil last year. And since then, it has been declared in other 15 countries. UNEG and OECD DAC Evalnet also enforce it. And as I said, uh, there are already parliamentarian forums that already adopted in, uh, in three regions. Now, and I'm almost at the end. What's What's next? What's going to happen after 2015? Because we are now, now we are creating a lot of expectations, also from policymakers, and everybody is starting to ask, OK, we, got, we get the message. Evaluation is important. Uh, we want to use that. But you, as evolution community, what are you going to do to support us? You, as evolution community, what are you going to do to bridge, once again, this gap between policymakers and evaluators. What are you going to do to make sure that the evaluations are relevant to our information gap? And that's why our partner is, is about to launch a global consultation of, on the global evaluation agenda for 2016 and 2020. So the, the idea is really, as an evaluation community, Evaluation Association, UN agencies, governments, private foundation, individual consultants, etc. That as a community, we should try to come up with a, the key priority for the next four years so that we will be able to address those uh, expectations that we, we are creating just now. So there is a, a proposal to launch a global online consultation that will be kick off with a global live webinar in early September this year, to be followed by eight weeks of online discussions. And, and then there will be a global event, probably at the Parliament of Sri Lanka next year, where this uh, uh, global evaluation uh, agenda 
will be officially launched. So to end with, I would like to reiterate that we are in a quite historical moment because we, we are changing the development paradigms. More and more countries are recognizing the importance of having equitable development results. And we as evolution uh, community, we should be able to, to really to address the, the future challenges. And, and, uh, for, and we, are, we, we have the, the opportunity, and each of, one, each of us has the opportunity really to frame the global evolution agenda for uh, an equitable development. So I would like to end just with an open invitation to each of, each of you really to try to get engaged in this global consultation and to get engaged at your country level. Once you go back to your country, try to get in contact with the National Evolution Association in your country and try to be active in your country to strengthen both the supply of evaluation but also the demand for evaluation. Because the challenge ahead is quite big and the only way to address those, that challenge is really if we come all together, respecting our own diversity, our own roles, but we come all together to work for the same objective. Thanks a lot for, uh, for your time. <laughs>